thank you very much to, to our third edition of the QMAT Cafe. It's uh, an initiative for, uh, of uh, QMAT uh, JIG, the Young Investigators Group uh, of QMAT that uh, try to spread a little bit the, what are the hot topics research that are carried out here in Strasbourg. And today we have uh, two local speakers, uh, Rashi Jane, who is a PhD student and works in the uh, Strasbourg Observatory. And he, she will talk about uh, glo globular clusters, Milky Way and beyond. She did her bachelor in Havalpur in the engineering college. Then she did a master degree in Indian Institute of Space Science and Technology. And afterwards she joined for the PhD in Strasbourg. After Rashi talk, we are going to have uh, uh, the professor Isabel Ribudo. She is a former student here in Strasbourg in the University Louis Pasteur. Um, Paris uh, 11 of Orsay, and she's now a CNRS uh, researcher. She works uh, with C uh, the CMS uh, at uh, detector at LHC of CERN, and now she's uh, studying uh, uh, beyond standard model uh, measurements uh, in the Bell 2 experiment in, in the CAP and Super CAP in Japan. So thank you very much for being here. Uh, it's uh, all yours. Uh, let me stop sharing this and you will be able to uh, share your screen. Rashi. Okay, thank so you. You're welcome. Thank you for having me here. So uh, as Manuel already introduced me, um, I skip past my introduction. Today I'm going to talk about globular clusters in general. Uh, I'll take you through the projects that I have done starting from my master's to my PhD on different globular clusters and different projects, how they are related uh, to one common goal but are very different from each other. In this slide you see uh, uh, an amazing picture of NGC 6397 which is taken from Hubble Space Telescope. So starting with the introduction of the star clusters, why are star clusters uh, important to us or before going to why they're important, I'll just tell you what they are. As the title says, stellar clusters are a group of star, uh, stars and these stars are gravitationally bound to each other. Uh, broadly speaking, they are classified into two main categories, globular clusters and open clusters. So, there are many differences between the globular clusters and the open clusters. Uh, the prominent ones being the globular clusters are really very, very old and they have uh, uh, a lot of stars as compared to the open clusters. So how old are we talking about here is uh, as old as uh, 10 giga years to 12 giga years. And they have uh, mm, uh, 100,000 to 1 million stars uh, closely packed in the uh, volume as small as 1 million parsec cube. So we're talking in terms of astronomical scales and when we talk about these numbers, this is actually very small. And just to give you an idea about one parsec, so one parsec is about 210,000 times the distance between Earth and the sun. So globular clusters have these many stars uh, packed uh, densely. And uh, open clusters are relatively young, so they are not as old as the globular clusters. They have younger stars and they have a relatively small number of stars, uh, as low as 1,000 to 10,000 stars. And they are loosely bound to each other gravitationally and they easily disrupt if they um, interact with uh, uh, gas clouds or other clusters surrounding them. Um, we see the picture of two clusters in this slide. The one is NGC 288, which is one of the uh, very old globular clusters. So we see that it is very spherical in shape. And the other one is Pleiades open cluster. It's one of the most popular open clusters, which we can actually see on a very clear night with our, open, uh, with our naked eyes. To understand the importance of the clusters uh, in our study, uh, let me take you to the life cycle of a star first. 
So stars are formed from mo uh, giant molecular clouds. So there is a giant molecular gas cloud which uh, collapses uh, when mm, the conditions are perfect uh, density wise and temperature wise. So it uh, starts to collapse. And then there uh, in one giant molecular cloud, uh, there forms a small pockets of local um, collapses. So there are uh, many stars uh, that are formed from one cloud. So these stars, when they are formed, they have different initial masses. Some stars, they, uh, the masses range from 0 0.2 times the mass of our sun to as high as 60 times the mass of our sun. And based on their masses, they evolve at different rates. So the stars which are massive, they evolve more rapidly than the stars which are less massive. So a slow mass star, um, a low mass star is a star that has uh, uh, mass similar to our sun um, or up to uh, five to six solar mass and the stars which have masses more than six times the mass of our sun uh, are usually counted as high mass stars. So the stars first, uh, um, when for, before, after they collapse, when they start their journey, they go to the main sequence, which is the most important part of the star's life. That's where the star burn hydrogen and convert it into helium uh, in its core. So the star, uh, uh, based on its mass, spend a, a certain time of its lifetime in this uh, particular uh, phase. So just to give you an idea about how a star, how much time a star spends uh, and how it is related to mass. So a star, if it has a mass uh, about one tenth of uh, the mass of our sun, can span as, as much as six to 12 trillion years in its main sequence, which is not even, uh, which is even uh, more than the actual age of our universe. So the stars which are born uh, when the universe was born are still burning hydrogen in their cores and they'll keep burning it for times to come. And for a star, which is the mass of our sun, it spends around 10 billion years in main sequence. So we are halfway through the main sequence um, uh, in our sun and it will continue to burn for another 5 billion years hydrogen in its core. As we go uh, upper in the masses, if, if a star is 60 billion years, it will spend nearly 3.4 million years in its main sequence. So what happens is in a globular cluster, or uh, if you talk about a, a giant molecular cloud where the stars are all born at the same time. So when they're spending different, uh, when they have different masses, what happens is they evolve at different rates and uh, a high mass star will reach uh, an advanced stage of evolution when a low mass star is still just burning hydrogen in its core. So the different stages of a star's life um, depend on what mass the star had when it was born. A low mass star will go to a red giant phase and then uh, eventually it will fizzle out into a planetary nebula and become a white dwarf. Whereas uh, a high mass star uh, dies more uh, uh, gloriously, it bursts into a supernova and becomes a neutron star or a black hole. So now this is uh, how we try to quantify our information about the, the evolution of the star uh, in terms of uh, observation. So uh, I'll introduce you to the Hertzsprung russell diagram or, or more popularly known as HR diagram. On the left, we see uh, the diagram and x-axis is temperature and y-axis is the luminosity of the star. Um, uh, Counterintuitively on the x-axis, we see hotter stars on the left uh, part of the axis and um, cooler stars on the right side of the axis. So the red uh, region is uh, like 3000 Kelvin and O region or the blue region is 30,000 Kelvin. So when we look at a star, uh, and we, uh, we can observe its luminosity and uh, somehow we know its temperature and we plot uh, a temperature and luminosity of the star on this plot, we can actually predict which part of its lifetime the star is in. And uh, a real color magnitude, uh, a real representation of such a diagram looks like uh, what we have on our screen on the right hand side. So this is a real color magnitude diagram, like how we call it. It's called Perlman's spectroscopy because we cannot easily, we cannot have easy access to temperatures or spectra of the star. So what we do is observe uh, the star in different bands, and then we have uh, on y-axis the magnitude in V band, which represents the luminosity, and uh, color, which is 
the difference between the magnitudes in two different bands or ratio of fluxes on the y axis on the x axis which is a proxy for the temperature of the star so when we uh, plot a uh, color versus magnitude we see something like this now this is a gl uh, globular cluster and uh, if we uh, actually believe that all this all these stars were born at the same time so we see the stars uh, on the bottom these stars are still in the main sequence of their lives whereas these stars have evolved to the red giant phases and uh, other uh, advanced phases of evolution which um, indicates that these are the low mass stars and then the mass increases as we rise uh, more top uh, on the advanced uh, level of evolution and this comes from our knowledge of how the globular clusters are formed and then we combine it with observations so this is what we see now Globular clusters are usually defined in textbook as simple stellar populations. So, simple stellar population they have just one population which is born, uh, which is born at the same time, and they evolve uh, um, together. So, they are co-evolving, and this is how we actually know um, how they have helped us. Is uh, they helped us to validate our, our our knowledge on the stellar physics. So, we have our theories that how. A star should evolve, and when we actually observe a globular cluster, we can um, validate that our models are actually correct in terms of our knowledge of how the star should evolve. So the properties that we know of a globular cluster is that these stars they have same age, they have same chemical composition, but with the advent of um, uh, better technology and better telescopes with better resolutions, when we looked even more closely uh, towards these globular clusters. it turned out that these are not as simple as we previously thought them to be they are not just composed of one single population of stars but they may have different uh, episodes of star formation or they have distinct population of stars which uh, differ in ages which differ in chemical compositions and this could be seen in this diagram which is another color magnitude diagram constructed from different filters um uh, on a hubble space telescope so from uh, a superior resolution that we uh, get as a result of um, the telescope being on being uh, in space uh, we can see uh, a better uh, color magnitude diagram here and in these different parts of the color magnitude diagram for example in mens main sequence uh, part of this uh, diagram there are these different sequences which indicate that these star uh, these sequences may not belong to one single population they may have uh, uh, different uh, chemical compositions or different ages or these different helium abundances which is also seen in the red giant phase of the cluster yeah so the bottom line was that these are not uh, the cl globular clusters are not as simple as one uh, believes them to be so this was the motivation of my first project and in this project i studied uh, the hot population of the globular cluster so we targeted it specifically at the horizontal branch for that we took the uh, ultraviolet data so hot stars are brighter in ultraviolet and this um, ensured that we do not have contamination from the colder stars So NGC two eight two eight is uh, one of the uh, Milky Way globular cluster, and it is known to have an anomalously um, uh, extended horizontal branch. And in our study, this is what indeed we found that we had a clustering of different groups of stars: so blue horizontal branch stars, extreme horizontal branch stars, and blue stars, etc. They form different groups in color magnitude diagrams uh, if we use different ultraviolet filters. the next project that we did was on another globular cluster uh, ngc 6397 which was also a part of my phd and uh, uh, just before i tell you about the project uh, i'll just uh, like to talk about uh, what is the basic motivation behind doing this study so uh, just to recall the waste displacement law we remember how the black body curve of uh, a black body curve looks like for different temperatures if we have a hotter body we'll have a peak at a hotter temperature or lower wavelength and then as we go on smaller um, 
or cooler, cooler temperatures, the peak shifts to higher wavelengths. And as we all know that the uh, stars are black bodies uh, or close to ideal black bodies, they should also follow the uh, they should follow the similar um, trend, and that's what they have. The hotter mm, we know that the spectra of a hot star should look like this, and a cooler star should look um, something like this. So on the right hand side, the figure shows the real life spectra of a star. Uh, of different temperatures. So the top star is uh, the O-type star, which has temperature as uh, high as 50,000 Kelvin. And as we go down, we have a G-type star, which has temperature as low as 6,000. And the peak keeps shifting towards uh, lower wavelengths. And because stars are not perfect black bodies, they do not have a perfect um, spectra like this one. So they have uh, emission lines and absorption lines. And the strength of these lines also depends on the temperature of the star or the abundance of the star or the mass of the star. So what we can do is compare these spectra with our model spectra and try to predict the properties of a star. So looking at uh, these um, spectra of the star, we can tell about the temperature of the star, the uh, composition of the star, and a surface gravity, which is also an indication of mass of the star. For that, what we do is compare the uh, observed spectra of the star with the models that we have. So that's what the basic idea or motivation behind uh, the study uh, or the project that I'm going to talk about. So astronomers have stellar libraries uh, with which we, they compare the observed spectra of the stars and then they tell about the properties of the star. These libraries are of two, two types, theoretical libraries and empirical libraries. So theoretical libraries comes from our knowledge of the physics and we construct the spectra uh, from what we know about the stars. Whereas empirical libraries, they come from the spectra of the real stars. So we observe real stars, we um, identify the properties and then we compare other observed spectra with these stars. Um, in this diagram, what we see is uh, coverage of these libraries. So the first panel, top and bottom both, uh, it shows the coverage of uh, theoretical spectra. Since uh, these are the stellar, um, these are the spectra that we are constructing, we can just give in uh, the temperature and metallicity that we want, and uh, we can ob obtain the spectra. So that is why it is more uniformly spaced, whereas the real stars are they what they are. So we do not have stars in all temperatures and all metallicities and all gravities. So we, whatever stars we have, it uh, covers the uh, phase of space. Uh, so the colored dots are the spectra of the uh, empirical libraries. The first one is theoretical and the rest two are the empirical libraries. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to compare the results uh, obtained from theoretical, theoretical libraries and compare them with empirical libraries to see if the results, they uh, agree with each other or not. So what we were looking at was a star diagram of um, NGC 6397. Uh, and a previous work uh, compared the spectra of uh, these stars with a theoretical library and uh, identified uh, a, an effect which is, uh, which is predicted to happen in the stars, which is called atomic diffusion. And, uh, so as a result of atomic diffusion, what happens is the elements uh, in the stars gets redistributed. So as the star rises from main sequence toward the giant branch, we see there is a, a change in metallicity of the star. So this change was uh, what we were targeting to predict with um, our theoretical and empirical libraries. So this is the result. So the first one is from a previous work, what they have got. So we focus on this region where um, uh, the metallicity changes and we compare it what, uh, with what we obtained from the empirical libraries. So what we were expecting or what we want to see is how much they agree with each other. And the result is that they do not really quite agree with each other. The three libraries produce results of different magnitudes. And uh, this is not this is not particularly a result, but it 
is an open question. It's a it's an it's an issue that we intend to solve. So uh, first, we want to put out the issue, and uh, then we want to find out ways to how to address this issue because in an ideal world what we want is a theoretical library and empirical library should complement each other and the results should be more consistent and the last one is my current project that i am working on is uh, looking at globular clusters now in other galaxy other far away galaxy so so far these clusters were in milky way so in Milky Way, when we are looking at clusters, they are very close to us and we can look at uh, individual stars. We can, we can observe individual stars in the cluster. But when we are looking at globular clusters uh, in galaxies, which are really far away from Milky Way, the globular clusters, they look like point sources. So it's really difficult to uh, distinguish these globular clusters from foreground, foreground stars and background galaxies. So. And the motivation behind doing this study is to study a wider range of globular clusters because what a sample we have uh, now is from our galaxy and uh, neighboring galaxies. So in order to have a more uh, broader um, property uh, of a globular cluster, we should be aim to have a bigger uh, sample of globular clusters. So we are looking at clusters in Virgo galaxy cluster. And this is one of the uh, gal this is one of the galaxies in Virgo cluster of galaxies, one of the big biggest galaxies called M87. And in an earlier work, what uh, they have found was the clusters, the distribution of clusters, um, distribution of clusters, um, actually changes the properties of the cluster. So the color distribution of these globular clusters, based on where they are found from this galaxy, changes the colors. So the right hand side, uh, the, the left um, figure shows where the clusters are and the right shows where, what are the colors of the clusters based on where they are located. But this is just from the one of the galaxies. And this helps us to understand um, uh, the properties of the clusters and in turn uh, the properties of the host systems and how these were formed. So just to, to increase the sample size, we are looking at another galaxy now and how do we uh, identify these clusters from uh, the images. So again, using the power of the color color diagram, um, which uses uh, three bands, ultraviolet, optical, and infrared, we can identify clusters, stars, and galaxies, and uh, tell them apart. So for example, in this diagram, what we see, these are the same figures, but the uh, bottom one is with a modification so that the gaps are um, exaggerated. The bottom sequence here is the stellar sequence. So these are the foreground stars of our galaxies. And then this middle sequence is the globular clusters in that image. And uh, uh, here uh, they have um, galaxies at low redshift. So this is the image that I'm working uh, right now on. And I am reducing the data from infrared um, telescope. Uh, in infrared, uh, the problem is that the sky is very variable uh, on small scale, especially and uh, on time uh, scales. So in order uh, to avoid saturation of the objects, we take a lot of uh, exposures and uh, for a small time, so 25 second or 10 second exposure, and we have thousands of images which, ha which we have to stack together after uh, subtracting the sky. So. That's what I'm doing right now. And hopefully I'll have a, a similar result or something more to show. So yeah, this is the end of my uh, presentation. To summarize, the globular clusters are seen as simple and uh, simple stellar population, but they actually are quite interesting with uh, different properties, even within one globular cluster. Then the stellar libraries, um, we are uh, we need more work on the stellar libraries in order to make theoretical libraries and empirical libraries more consistent with each other and the ongoing work is going on uh, identifying globular clusters from m uh, from elliptical galaxies and world cluster of galaxies to study the impact of environment on their properties thank you thank you very much Rashi. Uh, questions, please uh, raise your hand and we can mute. Yes. And I think Denise will check up if there is any 
any questions yeah, so on YouTube? There is a question on YouTube, and thank you very much for your talk. Um, so the question is from Luis. He asks, uh, perhaps it's a dumb question, but what is the difference between a stellar cluster and a galaxy? Okay. Uh, so stellar, cl stellar clusters are usually very small. Um, uh, in our own galaxy, we have like 140 gl uh, stellar cluster, uh, globular clusters and around 1,000 uh, uh, 1, uh, open clusters. So we can look at it like these are one of the building blocks of the galaxy, just like stars. They are also a part of galaxy. And... Um, they are formed very differently from the galaxies. So uh, one giant molecular cloud, when it collapses, it forms a lot of stars in one cluster. So that's just, uh, that's how the clusters are formed. And the galaxy formation is entirely different. So we have different kinds of galaxies, spiral, elliptical, and they are formed um, entirely different from how the clusters are formed. Good. So is there any, any other questions from the public or attendees? May I ask, maybe it's ir irrelevant or, or naive, but when you show your diagrams, um, you never speak of uncertainties on your points. Um, do you mean these? Uh, these uh... So those from the libraries are data taken by someone else you, with different technologies or maybe different sensitivities? and you just merge everything, though the sensitivities on each point is not the same? Uh, so for this one, for example, this, this particular set of data, it is taken from one telescope. And I do not mention un uncertainties on uh, these various quantities here, but uh, they are documented uh, in the literature. Um, I don't have the exact numbers right now, but yeah, uncertainties, uh, we take care of the uncertainty, un uncertainties everywhere on colors, luminosities, temperatures, everything. Okay, thanks. Um, I have another question from YouTube that's kind of linked to this one, a bit more tendentially. So it's from Mayank, who asks, um, so I will try to read it. Uh, it's a question with respect to how uh, we get data from empirical libraries, from real da data. So how do we minimize noise from clouds, air, light pollution, satellites, with SpaceX launching thousands of them, from the pictures of the galaxies, and what steps do we take to get more accurate data sets? A bit long question. That's, uh, yeah, so they are like, um that's what I'm struggling right now with my data. So before we get this clean data, we have to actually take care of all these things one by one. So every telescope, we are aware of the issues, uh, the instrumental problems, the problems on the sky. So sky subtraction takes care of most of these things. But then before we do, a, um, it's not one step process. It's before you finally do science, you have to do a lot of data reduction. And uh, there are detailed procedures of how to take care of each thing like you asked, but um, uh, I mean, I cannot summarize it in one answer, but I assure you that this data is clean as much as we can. Uh, and we have taken care of all these things, uh, the uh, satellites on the sky or the variability of the sky or um, you know, the extinction uh, because of the dust uh, between us and the object that we are observing. The limitations of the instruments and everything. So all this is counted in the uncertainty of our observations. I have a question. So uh, I, I was wondering, because you, you said that this will help you to uh, explain how the evolution of these globular clusters uh, happen. Uh, my question is, uh, is the density of black holes or such a supermassive uh, objects can affect the evolution of these globular clusters? Uh, not, not, I mean, not really, but, uh, so it was not known that they have globular clusters do have black holes, uh, or they do not have black holes, but uh, lately some observations show that there are black holes in these clusters. And if we can get, um, an idea about the mass and the properties of the black hole, probably we can say something about the initial population or the heavy masses, uh, heavy, uh, um, heavy masses stars. 
uh, in the clusters. So it will have implications if we are sure that there is a black hole in the cluster. But uh, besides, uh, I mean, if the black hole is outside or a general properties of black hole, I don't think so. Okay, thank you very much. You. I think uh, Suvit would like to do some question. I think you can do it. Let me just uh, give you... Maybe, maybe just before that, there was a question from Sally on YouTube. Uh, oh. She asked uh, like quite some time ago, she asked, uh, you mentioned something about the study of clusters and environments. Could you explain a little bit or to rephrase it? Does the study of clusters have any impact on Earth's environment? Uh, on Earth's environment, no. I, I just uh, so in uh, by that I meant that. Um, uh, for example, this one, yes. So M eighty seven is an elliptical galaxy, and this is the dense core of the galaxy. These are the clusters which are just which are located uh, either close to the galaxy or from uh, you know the from the center of the galaxy towards the tidal radius or beyond the tidal radius, and these purple ones here are located to close to other uh, satellite galaxies of M87. So these are found at different environments when you know the, the density of the stars and everything is different in all these four environments. So based on where they are found, their colors are different. So that's what I meant when I said that the properties depend on the depend on the environment where the clusters are found. Uh, uh, it does not have any impact on Earth's environment. Okay, so I have a probably a last question from Suvit. Uh, he cannot talk at the moment. Uh, so the question is. Uh, what could be the implication of research on society if there is any of I, I guess he refers to the to your to your research okay uh, so uh, I don't know what my direct implication uh, will be uh, of this research on the society but I'd like to think of myself as a part of the big loop where everyone is doing something and you know these uh, for example um, People usually ask this question: Why is uh, why do we pe why do people do astronomy? Because it's not something that is essential to uh, society. But um, I'd like to give you a small example how uh, you know we use Wi-Fi every day. But where Wi-Fi came from was the roots are from astronomy. We used it for radio astronomy. The radio astronomers used it, and then eventually it was extrapolated to the general use of the society. So that's what happens. You don't work. Uh, you know, research is not necessarily always pointed uh, directly towards achieving something for the mankind. But as a part of the bigger loop, I think I am contributing somewhere, some little bit, but maybe not directly. So it seems like maybe I'm not doing something for the society, but I like to believe that I am. Yeah, I think the research is uh, very important in any area, especially if scientific. Uh, he sent thanks for for answer. Sorry, Denise. Yeah, I was saying, you know, just saying it's a very beautiful answer to give. Yep. <laughs> so I think we can move on to our next speaker.